Um, good evening, everybody. I am absolutely thrilled to be here with all of you. As many of you, I think, probably know or could guess, this is the first time in over two years that we have been able to throw open these doors to the public, invite people into this very special space, and have an opportunity to share space, to listen, to speak, to learn, to be together. Much has changed over the course of those two plus years, but that need to be together and to have that opportunity has obviously only grown. And so I'm so grateful for all of you for making the time to be here this evening. And to all of those watching at home tonight, thank you for joining us as well. As I think some of you probably also know, my aunt ambassador, Vicki Kennedy, was unfortunately unable to make it this evening. Um, she was, I think, stuck in Washington um, with a delayed airplane, which many of us can probably relate to. Um, but uh, she sends her greetings and her regrets because she desperately was trying to be here this evening. I did get a message from her, and she wanted me to relay her gratitude to the Hume family for all of the time that they shared together, for decades of friendship, including what she mentioned was a very special visit to the memorial of Bloody Sunday in Derry. My uncle, Teddy, was so incredibly proud to have nominated John Hume for the Nobel Peace Prize. And he was particularly excited that the committee listened. John Hume was not just about freedom and justice and righteousness flowing down like an everlasting stream. He loved language, literature, and laughter. So it is so good to see our dear friend, Ambassador Daniel Mohall here as well, who embodies those three traits with the best of them. He brings the same, lo same love of poetry, song, of uh, language, the job of a diplomat that John brought to his work in politics. Ambassador, thank you for being here. I also want to recognize dear friend and ambassador Nancy Jacobson, excuse me, Nancy Soderbergh, forgive me, Nancy, um, who did so much work under President Clinton to advance this peace process. She's a dear friend of my family, and successive presidents have learned what members of my family have done, which is when you create a real mess, call Nancy. She is extremely deft at cleaning it up. The best compliment the Irish can give, some of you will know, is in fact a nickname. I don't know who first started calling her Nancy Sodabred, but I do know that that name stuck with everybody. Excellency Ambassador, thank you for being here. To Aidan Hume, John Sum, who had an extremely successful career in banking after wisely deciding to attend Boston College across the street from where we now call home. Like all the Humes, he has an ear for lyrics and wrote a poignant poem after his father's passing in 2020 that included the line, quote, leadership is the art of convincing others you're right not being prisoner to a base or projecting might. How we wish the world could be reminded of those words. And Sean Farron knows something about convincing people. As a stalwart disciple of John Hume's embrace of nonviolent approaches to social and political change, he spent decades of work as a leader in the Social Democratic and Labor Party, working on the front lines of negotiation and legislation. I know that we're all looking forward to the discussion tonight, led by Catherine Shannon, one of the most astute, well-connected, and informed followers on what used to be called the Irish question. On a personal note, I also want to send the regards from my dad, who I was with earlier today, but yet couldn't be here tonight. We were trading some stories about some of his visits to Ireland some of which, not surprising to Nancy, did in fact become an international incident. Not a surprise to anybody. But I do remember also the stories from my dad and the many late night calls he had with John Hume in the years that my father served on Capitol Hill. With tensions rising, 
with the latest protocol offered in Westminster to back out of a Brexit agreement. I can't imagine a better time, a better place, or a better group of experts to discuss the current events in Northern Ireland. Senator Kennedy's long friendship with John Hume, going back to that first meeting 50 years ago in Bonn, set the stage for the creation of Friends of Ireland on Capitol Hill, an increasing involvement of Congress and the White House in addressing social, political, and human rights issues in Northern Ireland. Without their friendship and close work together, would the Good Friday Agreement have ever been possible? I'll leave that for our experts to discuss tonight. But I do want to leave you with my thanks to all who gather here this evening for the love of Ireland, for peace and social justice, above all, for the incomparable John Hume. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, or please join me in welcoming his son, Amy. Thank you very much, Congressman, for those uh, very kind words. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good evening, and uh, thank you for coming. Funny, 50 years ago last week, a telephone call came to our home in Derry, and uh, it was Senator Kennedy uh, on the line. My dad thought that somebody was playing a, pr a practical joke on him, and uh, his response was, pull my other leg. But thankfully, he did believe, was convinced that it was indeed Senator Kennedy, and they agreed to meet in Bonn uh, in Germany the following week for a dinner. At the time, Parliament had been suspended, so my dad was a full-time politician without a salary, and he borrowed the fare from the local credit union. I think as, as a long-time banker, I'm not sure it's ever a loan that I would have made, but uh, it's certainly, you know, I'm very glad it was made because that dinner turned out to be a catalyst for a, a lot of positive events going forward. Through that dinner, the four horsemen were created Senator Kennedy, Speaker O'Neill, Senator Monaghan, and Governor Kerry of New York uh, to create pressure to help bring about conditions for a peaceful resolution of the problems in Ireland. The Four Horsemen became the Friends of Ireland, joined by people like then Senator Biden, our local congressman here, Brian Donnelly, and, uh, and, and many others. And over time, they uh, exerted their influence, always to create the conditions for a peaceful solution, never to try to dictate what that peaceful solution should be. Uh, and they, you know, it, it led to the Anglo-Irish Agreement, which was the, the key that really became, uh, unlocked the logjam to help everybody get around the table. Uh, the dinner also led to my dad doing a fellowship in Harvard in 1976. Uh, he spent two months in Cambridge, and that gave him an opportunity to network uh, both the U.S. political world and the, the media to help get his message across. And it also gave him time to write, uh, and he wrote an article for Foreign Affairs magazine at that time, The Irish Question, a, a British Problem which in many ways helped diagnose the problem for others and point to a roadmap going forward. Another benefit my father got from that dinner was really the power of example and inspiration. He talked to me many times about Senator Kennedy's acumen, his grasp of detail, his incredible knowledge of Ireland, and his legislative prowess. And I was very fortunate. I really got to see it at first hand on the night of Tip O'Neill's funeral. Tip, even from the grave, was trying to do what he could to help advance the cause of Irish peace. And uh, I had arranged to meet my dad for dinner, and he told me when I got there that we were going to meet Senator and Ambassador Kennedy and uh, the late Michael Kennedy at Lockobers. At the time, the peace process was underway, but it was very tenuous. And uh, my father was getting a lot of vitriol and abuse from all sides. And he was, he was definitely a little frazzled, but 
as usual, dug itself. I remember being really surprised at the dinner, at the questions that Senator Kennedy was asking, at his knowledge of the situation, at his sheer command of detail. And uh, it, was, it, 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 it was something that, that I found to be exceptional. Then, towards the end of the dinner, the, the discussion turned to whether it would be helpful for Jerry Adams to get a visa or not. Uh, Senator Kennedy concluded, uh, based on my father's advice, that it probably would be helpful. Uh, so he talked about what he would do to help bring that about. And I don't think it's any coincidence that shortly thereafter, Jerry Adams got his visa to come to the US, something I think many historians will look upon as really the key cement that helped uh, bring about the ceasefire in 1994. It's Senator Kennedy's in involvement in Ireland didn't end with the Good Friday Agreement. You know, after the Good Friday Agreement, he worked closely with the McCartney sisters, uh, whose brother Robert had been tragically killed in Belfast to really make it clear that the nonsense had to stop and that there would be consequences for stepping out of line. He also worked very closely with Seamus Mallon and others uh, after the, the agreement and really helping bring about the conditions for a, a, a rebirth of policing and reestablishing the police force. Uh, he created a legacy that lives on today. We saw it a couple of years ago when Speaker Pelosi and Chairman Neil led a bipartisan group uh, to Ireland to walk the border and then to London to meet with the British government to let them know that a, trade, a bilateral trade bill would not pass through Congress if uh, a hard border was re-established in Ireland through Brexit. And I think if any of you look at the nonsense going on today with the, uh, the, the protocol we see that that continued influence is needed more than ever. Senator Kennedy was a remarkable individual. He really, he led by example. For my father, he showed him how to cross the aisle, while, uh, how to compromise, while remaining true to your integrity and remaining true to who you are. The fact that he did so much for Ireland and none of it was really known during his lifetime. It just shows what a colossus figure he was. And when you think of what a small piece what he did for Ireland uh, was compared to his overall achievements and his legislative uh, work over the years, just shows what, a, what an incredible person he was and what a force for good uh, he, 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 he was. It really is, po politicians these days are, you know, they're much maligned, but in all of the Friends of Ireland, every uh, group, everything they did for Ireland, you know, there was no political upside. There was, a, 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 there was no votes in it. If anything, the pressure groups back in their districts were arguing for a harder line, but they persevered because it was the right thing to do. Just another example of politics being a force for good. So I think we all owe a great debt of gratitude to Senator Kennedy and also I think to Ambassador Kennedy and the entire Kennedy family. I know as the son of a politician that when you, you have one uh, party to the marriage who is doing everything they can to make the world a better place, it usually means the other party to the marriage has to give up a lot of their life to that cause as well. And I think we'd really like to thank Ambassador Kennedy for everything that, that, that she contributed. So thank you. Thank you again for coming. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, you are all very welcome here this evening. My name is Leisha Moore. I'm the Irish Consul General in Boston, and what a pleasure it is to work once again with our good friends in the Kennedy Institute to be back in this beautiful venue um, here with you all this evening and to mark such a momentous occasion. And we are absolutely delighted to be partnering with the John and Pat Hume Foundation to mark the anniversary of the meeting of John Hume and Senator Kennedy 
those, all those years ago, a, a meeting that was so influential as we have seen for the future of Northern Ireland. And this evening provides an opportunity to re reflect on what that relationship meant, as we have seen for the path to peace in Northern Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement. And it's also a very timely reminder of the very, very positive contribution that Irish American and American people and politicians have made and continue to make towards peace and prosperity on the island of Ireland. But it's not only a reflection on the past, because it's also an opportunity for us to hear the views of a very distinguished panel on current developments, because 24 years on, the Good Friday Agreement is in the news again as we continue to grapple with the outworkings of the UK's decision to depart the European Union and the implications of that for Northern Ireland. The protocol in Ireland, on Northern Ireland, as many of you here will know, was specifically designed by the European Union and the United Kingdom to mitigate these impacts of Brexit on Northern Ireland and to protect us the gains of the Good Friday Agreement. As we look back on the journey to peace in Northern Ireland, it's clear that it was partnership, vision and compromise which delivered the Good Friday Agreement. And it is this same spirit of partnership and vision and compromise that is required now to get beyond our current challenges on the implementation of the protocol. Because looking back, if the history of Northern Ireland teaches us anything, it's that jointly agreed solutions rather than unilateral actions are what brings us real progress. And it's working together in a spirit of trust which will safeguard the gains of the Good Friday Agreement and deliver real peace, stability and opportunity for the people of Northern Ireland. And it's incumbent on all sides to uphold their international agreements and obligations. So I look forward very much to hear our panel reflect on some of these themes this evening. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Professor Catherine Shannon who is not only a distinguished scholar of Irish and Irish American and British Irish history, she also played an active role herself in the, during the peace process in Northern Ireland, especially with women's groups. She's also worked long to build connections and understanding between Ireland and the United States, so I think she is extremely well placed to moderate this evening's discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our moderator, Professor Catherine Shannon. Thank you. arthritis in the knees, uh, acting up <laughs> a bit tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, it has been a distinct privilege of my life to have known and worked, if only a little bit, with John and Pat Hume, whose contributions to the principles of equal rights, inclusion, respect, and embrace of difference and of constitutional methods have inspired thousands within Ireland and beyond. I am honored to introduce our three panelists this evening whose contributions to ending the Northern Irish conflict and that produced the negotiations that led to the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 are immense. The Good Friday Agreement is a foundational document whose provisions reflect John Hume's vision of a pathway to peace and reconciliation. I know like me, you are anxious to hear their comments and insights on the historical legacy of John and Pat Hume in laying the solid foundations of democratic values and principles and politics for the island of Ireland. And as our uh, first uh, panelist that I will introduce this evening, it's my pleasure to recognize Ambassador Dan Mulhall. Born in Waterford, educated at University College Cork, where he studied history. He has had a 43-year career with the Department of Foreign Affairs with postings throughout the globe, all the way from New Delhi to 
Edinburgh to Australia. Prior to becoming Ireland's 18th ambassador to Washington in 2017, Dan was ambassador to Malaysia, Germany, and the United Kingdom. As the Department of Foreign Affairs Director of General of European Affairs and as a member of the Secretariat of the Forum for Peace and Reconciliation, and later as a press counselor for the Irish government delegation to the, good, the talks that led to the Good Friday Agreement, Dan has a wealth of knowledge and experience relating to the Northern Irish conflict and the process that produced that agreement in April 1998. Additionally, Dan is a, a fan of social media and he informs and entertains us greatly on Irish literature, uh, most especially in relation to Ulysses, and he's just published a book on Ulysses. Ambassador Nancy Soderberg is with us tonight, coming all the way from Kosovo. She had over 30 years experience in foreign policy in various positions in presidential campaigns, in the White House, as well as uh, the US Senate, and of course, at the United Nations. In recent years, she has worked with organizations that promote democracy and conflict resolution throughout the globe. Shortly after earning her master's of science degree from Georgetown School of Foreign Affairs in 1984, Nancy joined the Senate staff of Senator Edward Kennedy, where she began her longtime involvement with promoting peace in Northern Ireland. It was in 1985 that I first met Nancy on a congressional staff fact-finding trip to Northern Ireland in preparation for the establishment of the important International Fund for Ireland. Nancy served as Senator Kennedy's point person on Northern Ireland up to 1992 when she joined the Clinton-Gore campaign. Then to the White House, and as the third ranking official on the National Security Council, her expertise on Northern Ireland informed President Clinton's crucial and positive initiatives to end the conflict and begin the formal negotiations that led to the Good Friday Agreement. Our third panelist this evening is Professor Sean Farron, who is chair of the John and Pat Hume Foundation which we are introducing to you tonight in Boston. Sean was born and raised in Dublin. He spent some time teaching in Africa before he came to Northern Ireland. As a longtime member of the SDLP, Sean was a close friend and colleague of John and Pat Hume. He served as the senior SDLP negotiator from 1996 to 1998, and subsequently was elected as the uh, assembly member from Northern Antrim, uh, representing Northern Antrim. He held two ministries in the power sharing executive, first as Minister for Higher Education and later as Minister of Finance and Personnel. Sean retired from politics in 2007, and then he took up his pen and produced three books that focus on the history of the SDLP, and also on John Hume's legacy as a peacemaker. It is a distinct personal pleasure for me to introduce Sean to you tonight because he came to Westfield State College where I taught in 1985 as a visiting professor for one semester. And my students and I both benefited immensely from his inside knowledge of Northern Irish politics. So I would ask our three panelists to come up and take their seats. Okay. And now each of our panelists will have a short opening statement and then we'll get into some questions there afterwards. And Ambassador Mulhall, if you would like to start. Well, thank you very much, um, Catherine, and thank you all for being here. Um, 
I knew John Hume quite well. Got to know him when I was a press spokesman in Brussels, and he was a regular visitor, of course, as a member of the European Parliament. And uh, what I remember about John Hume was how indomitable he was, how he just persevered. He showed uh, those qualities that I think are most important in, in public life, uh, patience, perseverance, and persistence. And he had a great gift for words. W.B. Yeats once wrote, in a different context, words alone are certain good. And John Hume demonstrated the power of words. It wasn't like words that you might find in, written by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence, or indeed the words of the Proclamation, which are designed to inspire and to, to create aspiration. For John Hume, I think, the gift of words that he had was the gift of finding solutions to political problems, using words to fix those solutions onto the wall of public life. And I, I in, pre in preparation for this evening's event, I, I read over some of the, the documents that um, chronicle the history of our peace process, uh, starting with the Sunningdale Agreement in 1973 and going on to the more recent agreements, including the agreement in uh, 2020 about a new decade, new agenda. And throughout that process, and particularly in the early years, and from the, the time of the Anglo-Irish Agreement to the uh, Good Friday Agreement and beyond, you can actually see the spirit of John Hume running through those documents. Because certain phrases were created. Like, for example, parity of esteem. Now, that's not exactly a phrase you would use in everyday life. But it was an important phrase because what it did was it projected the idea of respect for the different traditions that share Northern Ireland, in particular the Unionist and the Nationalist traditions. So party of, party of esteem became this sort of, this phrase that ran through a series of agreements. And then you had the phrase totality of relationships. Again, this is a phrase that was created. It, it was created in order to to convey the idea that it wasn't all about British-Irish relations, that there were a series of relationships that had to be dealt with. So that was, for me, the great gift that John Hume had, that gift for persevering and for putting forward his ideas. And his, his principal idea was the need for people to sit down and talk. He wasn't, I mean, he had ideas about what the outcome should be. Of course he had. But his key gift was to persistently and patiently argue the case for peaceful resolution of the problems of Northern Ireland and for getting away from the spilling of blood that had been an all too prevalent part of life in Northern Ireland. And John Hume's relationship with Ted Kennedy was part of a continuum that goes on to this very day. It starts in the 19th century when Irish Americans who came here in conditions of deprivation, fleeing from, from hunger, starvation at home, came here to create new lives for themselves and their families. And they then started to influence the affairs of Ireland by putting pressure on their government here in the United States to weigh in in favor of Ireland. I don't believe we would have become independent in 1922 had it not been for the influence of Irish Americans on the US government and Congress, and then the US government putting pressure on Britain to do the right thing by Ireland. You turn the clock forward to the peace process. I don't think we would have had the Good Friday Agreement had it not been for the influence brought to bear by Irish Americans on successive administrations and successive congressional delegations in order to again put pressure on the British government to 
to accommodate the complexities of Northern Ireland and to create an agreement that could reflect Northern Ireland's unique character of a society divided between different traditions, which needed to be accommodated in order to create the basis for peace and political progress in Ireland. And then up to today, when you have Irish-American politicians continuing to weigh in, to send signals to London that if there is any cutting across the Good Friday Agreement, a price will be paid by Britain in terms of its relations with the United States and, and the trade agreement that people who support Brexit so desperately want to achieve between the UK and the United States. So, for me, it's, it's a, a pleasure to be able to be here on this panel, to be able to pay tribute to John Hume and Ted Kennedy, but also to be able to thank, through you, Irish America, for the great things that you have done, not just today, but yesterday and the day before, and going back to the 19th century, when the Irish in America have become a factor in the Irish question, a factor that has been very much to the benefit and advantage of Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Soderbergh. Well, first of all, Catherine, thank you so much for um, being here with us and moderating. It's wonderful to, to see you again. I want to thank Sue Hamann of the Kennedy Library for making this possible, Council General Moore for um, bringing me over here and also uh, partnering this, and of course, the Hume Foundation has shown us um, leadership. And tonight is really a tribute to the bond between uh, two great men of peace, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy and, and SDLP leader John Hume. Uh, but it's also a human story. Um, I worked for Kennedy for six years, as, um, as Catherine said, and his desk was right back there. And many, many, many hours in this uh, chamber doing legislation, but there was a whole nother um, life outside of this. And top of Senator Kennedy's list was uh, Northern Ireland and achieving peace in Northern Ireland. And on his door of the Senate office, it had um, Milke de Falta, in, which is the Gaelic greeting for um, a million welcomes? 100,000 welcomes. 100,000 welcomes. And um, yeah, he, he, it was in his heart. Um, and he uh, relied on John Hume for his guidepost. I started working for him in 85. Um, and. I didn't know anything about Northern Ireland except I had an Irish grandmother. Uh, but he wanted to make a difference for peace. And at the time, Northern Irish America was split into those who followed more the Sinn Féin line and those who followed John Hume. And um, he created a whole other narrative to how to have peace in Northern Ireland that didn't involve the IRA, but involved negotiation. And Hume always said, it's about people, not territory. And it's um, human dignity. He was a human rights activist, as uh, Bill Clinton called him, a, the Martin Luther King of Northern Ireland, but uh, was a, a force for nature. And the two of them uh, were lockstep in driving uniquely together the um, peace process that was really started with Jimmy Carter went through all the way up until the Good Friday Agreement. Um, but Joe, um, Congressman Kennedy asked, you know, would the Good Friday Agreement have happened without these two men? I don't think so. Uh, might have happened later, but at the moment of history, John Hume's vision of uh, equal rights and a, a, a democratic peace process that did not involve violence and Ted Kennedy taking that vision and driving it through the halls of power, first with the Carter White House and then uh, through Irish America, building up a strong support in this chamber, in the, in the Senate as well as the House, creating the politics of being able to say no to the UK's policy of um, refusing to engage, not understanding how the role of the United States could help, not hurt, and bridge that gap. So it was an honor to be together with them. Um, in that journey and learning at the Sea of Masters. And when I went, ended up at the White House, all of a sudden I found myself the Irish person. And the first person I would call on everything was John Hume. 
And in deciding whether or not to give Jerry Adams a visa, which was really the linchpin to the ceasefire, which was the linchpin to the Good Friday Agreement, when I first got to the White House, John said, no, it's not ready. By that fall, I remember bringing him into the White House for lunch in the mess right off the Situation Room, uh, which at the time I didn't realize was banned to foreigners, but nobody, nobody said anything. Um, and he said, now's the time to do it. Um, and he had also lined up, of course, Senator Kennedy and all of the Senate. It would not, never have happened had John Hume said yes. So that unleashed the whole process. Um, to, to get the peace process. So absolutely, it was um, John Hume's vision and, and tenacity. And then just on the human side, um, Senator Kennedy and John Hume, they just loved being together. I remember some really fun evenings at his home playing the piano. Uh, a friend of mine was actually playing the piano, and you know, we were reminiscing about this the other day. Um, they just loved a good song, a good gab, a good joke, and they just loved each other's company. So it was just a, a match made in heaven, and it really fundamentally changed presidents, prime ministers, party leaders, and brought peace to Northern Ireland. So it was an honor to be along for the ride. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Sean? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much indeed, uh, Catherine. And can I say, I'm delighted to be here in this uh, great institution. And I thank uh, the Edward Kennedy Institute for uh, the opportunity uh, to engage in, in, in this event here uh, this evening. Those of you who can recall, or maybe who have read about the situation in the early 1970s in Northern Ireland, will know that it was rapidly deteriorating. The violence had broken out in the late 1960s. It persisted and evolved and developed and it left Northern Ireland in the minds of many teetering on the edge of almost outright civil war. There didn't seem to be room for any compromise. Senator Edward Kennedy shared the unease that was felt in Irish America about the situation in Northern Ireland where many Irish Americans uh, supported the violence of the IRA and believed that only through violence could Irish unity be achieved and British withdrawal, withdrawal effected. But Senator Kennedy uh, took a more sensible, if you like, approach, and he sought advice and information from somebody who was at the coalface in Northern Ireland. And the person suggested to meet him, as we know, uh, was John Hume. John was then a young uh, politician. He had been elected to the Northern Ireland Assembly in 1969. And he met, again, as we know, the event that we're commemorating today, he met with Senator Kennedy in Bonn, in West Germany. And it wasn't just a simple one-off briefing that John gave Senator Kennedy. It was a discussion, a conversation that evolved into an ongoing relationship, indeed a friendship, as Aidan has outlined uh, to us earlier, a friendship between the two and they were joined by the others who formed uh, the Four Horsemen, as they were called. Senator Daniel Moynihan, Governor Hugh Carey, Speaker Tip O'Neill. And beyond that core group of four, there were others elected uh, to public office in the United States who formed the, the Friends of Ireland and who over the years, particularly through their annual St. Patrick's Day statements, uh, articulated the view and the approach that John Hume offered, an approach characterized by a stand against violence, total opposition to the use of violence in order to try and achieve Irish unity and a British withdrawal. The friendship that grew between those two men was significant 
in shaping the ideas that were to find their way eventually and sadly um, over a much longer period than any of them had envisaged into the Good Friday Agreement. The principles that John articulated and which uh, Edward Kennedy accepted and endorsed were partnership in Northern Ireland between the main communities, partnership and a power sharing executive, relationships between North and South in Ireland, between a government in Northern Ireland and governments in the South of Ireland, a partnership between Ireland and Britain in addressing together the problems in Northern Ireland. And these approaches were underpinned by John's and Edward Kennedy's strong endorsement of the principles of the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland, which had taken to the streets in the mid to late 1960s, had been inspired by the civil rights movement here in the United States. They built on that and sought support for the principles, as I say, of the civil rights movement and also the opportunities for people across the communities to work together, spilling their sweat together and not their blood, working in a spirit of respect for each other's uh, traditions. John so frequently talked about each one of us being born different, not being responsible for the community and the culture that we were born into, but each one of us deserving respect as individuals, respect for our traditions in Northern Ireland, spilling our sweat and not our blood, and working with Senator Kennedy and others in the Irish American uh, diaspora to impress on British governments, successive British governments, the need, the need for power sharing, north and south, for power sharing and uh, partnership between east and west. Translated into the Good Friday Agreement, uh, these principles and these proposals for partnership, these uh, proposals for partnership found expression in the key institutions established by the Good Friday Agreement, the Assembly and the Executive, the Power Sharing Executive in Northern Ireland, the North-South Ministerial Council to bring ministers and government between North and South together to, to work on mutually beneficial uh, projects, relationships to be developed and articulated more positively and effectively between Ireland and Britain through the British-Irish uh, Council. Those were the principles, I say, and the proposals that were articulated by John Hume and that were gradually accepted through the negotiations uh, that led to the Good Friday Agreement. Negotiations, of course, as you probably well know, chaired by Senator George Mitchell. And for a short period, and I was privileged to be a member of the uh, power sharing executive that took office in 1999 and served until 2002. For a short period of time, it seemed as if the, the spirit and the enthusiasm and the eagerness for compromise and for working together had been achieved. But sadly, as we know, since the mid 2000s, the institutions in Northern Ireland, the institutions between North and South, and the institutions between Ireland and Britain have suffered a stop-go experience, in suspension, out of its suspension, back into government, and regrettably now, due to the effects of Brexit and the legacy, um, the legacy legislation that the British government is putting through Parliament to excuse, if not excuse, but to uh, prevent any further prosecutions taking place where uh, men and women of the, of the security forces, men and women of the paramilitary organizations will be uh, free from any prosecution 
that would take place, uh, that might take place um, because of conduct that they engaged in during the troubled period. We are now in a, another state of hiatus where due to the British government's approach to Brexit and due to the legacy legislation that I've just spoken about, uh, the institutions are suspended. And although we had elections um, early in May to the Assembly, the Assembly hasn't effectively operated. The Government of Northern Ireland hasn't been formed. And there is no immediate prospect of the government being formed. No immediate prospect of the uh, Assembly working as intended. And so, regrettably, as I say, the institutions that we created and invested so much hope and expectations into in 1998, those institutions have left us in a state of limbo, in a state of where uh, there is a degree of disillusionment with politics in Northern Ireland. If we elect people and they don't take office, what, does, what message does that send uh, to the general population regarding the possibilities that might exist within politics to create a society in Northern Ireland which is based on respect and based on the principles of the civil rights a movement that I spoke about. So where are we now? What's the prospect for any return to any of those institutions? It's not very clear. It seems as if there is an impasse in the negotiations taking place, or should be taking place, between uh, the e European Union and the British government. And the internal politics of the UK seem to be playing into a scenario that does not hold out the prospect for progress, for change, and for a return to the spirit of hope and expectation that we tried to generate through uh, the Good Friday Agreement. An agreement uh, to which Stan and Nancy have underlined so many people here in the United States contributed to in all kinds of, of ways and who wish to see the prosperity that the people of Northern Ireland deserve, that that could be realized. So I thank you for your attention. I look forward to uh, the questions and discussion that will follow for the rest of our event this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I th I think one thing that was very unique about Senator Kennedy and John Hume is that they personally felt the pain and the, and the tragedy of what was going on in Northern Ireland. In 1972, when they met, 697 people had lost their lives to violence. On the very day, November 22nd, when they met in Bonn, two uh, dairymen were killed one Catholic, one Protestant, uh, in a tit-for-tat sectarian uh, scene, leaving five children fatherless. And that was the ninth anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. So it was a, a day marked by painful memories for both men. Uh, and I think that was one of the great things about John and Pat Hume. They understood the human cost of what the political conflict and the paramilitary conflict was imposing on the people of Ireland. Now, um, Ted Kennedy and Tip O'Neill were crucial in securing the promise of President Carter's uh, financial aid that he promised if the Dublin government and the UK government could join up and work together to find a solution, or at least the pathway to a solution. And eventually, uh, that came to a reality in the establishment of the International Fund for Ireland, 
which had bipartisan support in Congress. Uh, perhaps, Sean, you can lead off by commenting on what the impact of the International Fund for Ireland was on the people in Northern Ireland and in the border areas and how uh, it changed their lives on the ground. Yes. John, John Hume, in his approach uh, to a, re a resolution of the situation in Northern Ireland, frequently uh, emphasized the need to give people the possibility of full employment, the need to give hope to people in their ordinary lives. And as Catherine has drawn attention to the fact that through John's influence supported by Senator Kennedy and the others in the Friends of Ireland movement, uh, through the support that they were able to garner and came into um, existence through the International Fund for Ireland in, in the, late, the mid to late 1960s. The projects that have been supported by the International Fund down through the years have been very significant, particularly in disadvantaged uh, communities. And I pay tribute uh, to those here in the United States who supported the whole concept of the International Fund and who have helped to ensure that on an annual basis the fund is, is sustained and developed because it has been a significant uh, contributor uh, to the relief of disadvantage in so many communities across Northern Ireland. And it is linked with um, many other funds. Uh, the International Fund for Ireland has attracted support from the EU, um, and the EU has its own peace programs um, operating in Northern Ireland, which have also been very significant in many disadvantaged communities. So the people in Northern Ireland have a great deal to be grateful for to the European Union's funds and to those that come from the International Fund from Ireland. Nancy, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, sure. I think you see this in peace processes around the world where everyone feels like they're a victim um, and everyone feels denies the victimhood of the other. And so both traditions in Northern Ireland felt victimized, felt threatened, and it's um, compromise is disloyal. And so this zero sum mentality, when you, when you want to shift the paradigm and get to yes in a peace process, you have to have people see that it's a win-win situation. If one community gets jobs, that's not going to hurt me, it's going to make my life better. And John understood that in spades because he knew that if people had jobs, they would be invested in this. And I remember going through him taking me on one of my first trips to Derry through these very uh, poor neighborhoods where no one had a job. And um, it, he understood that if you could just give people jobs, shift the mentality, and everyone would understand winning. And that's what the essence of the Internet. We called it the Tip O'Neill Fund <laughs> because he, he was the one who really drove it through the house. And of course, Senator Kennedy sitting in his desk over there drove it through here. But um, it had a huge impact. And I think it's the, one of the dangers of the um, sort of careless withdrawal from the EU and Brexit is, and the, the threat of a hard border is what it's going to do to the economy of that area. And that just puts it back into the zero-sum game mentality. It's very dangerous, and so we need to make sure that you know, jobs, prosperity, and that the whole Brexit issue doesn't set us back to the same mentality that will be very hard to undo. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to return to the visa question, the Jerry Adams visa question. You mentioned how you worked hard uh, on that issue, and first were very doubtful of its uh, positive aspects and then changed, uh, changed your mind after John Hume's advice and his acute awareness of the proper timing. Um, I'd like to kind of take a little sidetrack and ask you about the role of Jean Kennedy Smith in that operation because I believe she was an American ambassador who made uh, trips from Dublin up to the north and visited both communities 
And indeed, she encouraged me to invite uh, Ian Paisley's son to come to a conference that I was having in, in Westfield at uh, one stage, which kind of shocked the people, the Irish American community in Westfield that they had uh, Ian Paisley's son among them, but he was treated very well and it was the only one that had a hotel room. Everybody else was boarded out to my friends. But I think she, she probably pl plays a, a very important role in, in this whole process. And you would have seen that, I think, Absolutely, directly. and I don't think she's ever gotten full credit, but she deserves full credit. It, uh, none of this would have happened without Jean Kennedy Smith, and none of it would have happened without her and John Hume teaming up. Um, as Ada knows, I'm sure you spend a fair amount of time in uh, the circles there, but the um, uh, Jean Kennedy Smith was um, Ted Kennedy's sister, and not coincidentally, he managed to propel her into the um, position knowing that she would be just a, a fierce ally, and she, I think, in, in my view, has really been the best U.S. ambassador ever. The State Department didn't really like those trips north, and I was at the White House at the time and was getting the, why, she's not the ambassador to the north, and she didn't really care, <laughs> and just um, marched her own drum, and she was frankly right. Um, she saw before I did at least the need to move quickly on the visa. And then um, once uh, we gave Jerry Adams the visa, uh, she was relentless in pushing it. And to her credit, she was the only person in the entire State Department that supported our efforts. Um, we had the opposition of the Secretary of State, the Justice Department, the, um, the FBI director, everyone saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And she was relentless saying, no, you should do it, and here's why. Um, and when we finally gave the visa, the ceasefire didn't come, didn't come, didn't come. And I frankly had given up and was saying, all right, now how can we isolate you know, Sinn Féin if they're not going to deliver on this? The president stuck his neck out. And in August, before the, um, the ceasefire, um, Jean Kennedy called me again. This is after eight months after we'd given the visa to Jerry Adams, saying, oh, you have to give another visa to the most hardline of the IRA, Joe Cahill. And I'm like, no way. <laughs> and she, I, was, I remember I was at um, my, my nephew's here, and he was, they were, I was visiting his family in California over, Christmas, uh, over summer. And um, she tracked me down in a hotel room, I don't know how, in California and said, you have to give Joe Cahill a visa. I'm like, Jean, I'm on vacation, call me later. And she goes, no. And she got Albert Reynolds to call Bill Clinton and me. I absolutely would not have done that. And the, the reason that the Cahill visa was so important is that the heart, Jerry Adams wanted to avoid a split in, Northern, in the IRA. Um, and knew that if Joe Cahill couldn't convince the hard line in the United States that th there would be a split in the IRA if they moved it. And so because of Gene Smith, we gave the visa to Joe Cahill, who did come to the United States, and then they had the, the ceasefire after that. And it would not have happened without her. So you're right to bring it up. Um, she, um, and, and honestly, the many in the Kennedy family, Joe, Joe senior uh, was very involved in trying to push the administration to do more. So the, um, uh, I think, and it all comes back to John Hume's tentacles reach very, very deep in, in uh, Irish America and the Kennedy family. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Dan, did you have any comment to make about that in relation yeah. to the position of the Irish government well, at look, the time? Every peace process is a kind of a journey, and that's why I'm glad that the word journey is used in the title of tonight's event, because it is a journey. And like any journey, it has its smooth passages, and it has its rough bit of ground that you have to get over. And the Northern Ireland Peace Process has been a series of, of, of bumps in the road that have had to be circumvented in some way. And the first of those was, would the ceasefire hold? Would, I remember being told when I was uh, in, on the Secretariat of the Forum for Peace and Reconciliation, over lunch one day, I remember being told by a senior Sinn Féin person who had also been involved in the IRA, I'm quite sure, though they probably would have denied it, um, that two things. We're not going back. We're not going to split. And I remember thinking, but that's pretty difficult to combine those two things. But they had to be combined. 
and they were combined, and it required a lot of manoeuvring, and one of those manoeuvres was the visa, the issuing of the visas. That, the, that, that was one of the ways of getting around some of the hurdles. And we've had a series of hurdles ever since. And the current hurdle, of course, is Brexit, yeah. which is a scourge. It's, it's, like a, it's like a virus in that it has infected the body politic um, in Britain, and it's spilled over, of course, into Northern Ireland, and at the moment, we need a lot of support from the United States to try and deal with that particular bump in the road. It's more than a bump in the road, it's probably the most serious bump in the road we've had for quite a long time because it, 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 it does threaten to undermine the progress we've made on the Good Friday Agreement. It has actually frozen it and is likely to continue freezing the um, political process in Northern Ireland for some time to come. Um, Brexit is a, is a, a very unwelcome uh, visitor to the Northern Ireland peace process because it was always going to cause problems. Those problems were foreseeable. Everyone ignored them uh, during the referendum campaign. I tried my best to remind people of how complicated it was going to be in Northern Ireland if Britain left the European Union, but there was no willingness to listen to those arguments. Uh, and now we're having to face those arguments, and they're complicated because they, they drive another wedge between people in Northern Ireland in a way that's unhelpful. And we have to get around this. And I think we do need the support of our friends in America to try and navigate this particular bit of rough water. Right, right. Uh, I just have one more question before I turn to the audience. Uh, and uh, I hope the panelists can g give a short answer. We know uh, from history the very positive contributions that people like George Mitchell, Mitchell mm -hmm. Reese, uh, made uh, yeah. as envoys. Uh, to Northern Ireland. Is it time now for the United States to get an envoy over to Northern Ireland to help get over these obstacles? Should, I can give you a very short answer. Yes, for short answers, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, th I think it would, be a, it would be a positive thing. Northern Ireland is currently in a situation of, of difficulty. You've got the Brexit issue, you've got the standoff between the parties over forming a new executive, even allowing the assembly to do its work. Uh, in the past, whenever we've got into difficulty with our peace process, with our political process, US assistance has always been helpful for two reasons. Because Americans are very good at reminding people of the big picture. Northern Ireland's been described as a narrow ground because people do get obsessed with their differences. Uh, and it can be difficult for them to step back and see the, uh, the wood from the trees. Americans are very good at reminding people of where we've come from. And let's be honest, however many difficulties we've had over the last 25 years, we've had a quarter of a century now of peace in Northern Ireland. What does that mean? It means that for 25 years, only a handful of people have died as a result of the conflict. The previous 25 years, three and a half thousand people yeah. lost their lives. So however imperfect this peace process may be, however difficult it may be, it has saved thousands of lives. And Americans are good at reminding people of that big picture. And the other thing that Americans are good at is reminding people of the economic, um, yeah. the economic dividend uh, from peace. And I think it would be very good for an American person to go over there on behalf of the administration and say, look, you can benefit hugely in terms of your prosperity, by taking advantage of having access to the UK market and to the European single market. That's a plus for you. Nobody seems to want to focus on that, though it's an obvious benefit. I think Americans will be good at reminding Northern Irish people about that reality right. and that opportunity. Thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, it's time now. Can We're can open just, for questions. Sorry, oh, John, sorry. Can I just add, add, add a point uh, with respect to the suggestion that uh, an American envoy at this particular time would be helpful. I agree with that. But when we look back over the last 25 years, the high point of US intervention and involvement with us was, of course, through Senator George Mitchell. And since then, we've had several envoys who've done excellent work and managed, indeed, to coax the parties into agreement on a number of issues. But the agreements have rested on the shelf. Um, that's not the fault of uh, those who came to assist us in trying to reach an agreement. It's, it's our fault that we didn't move to have uh, the agreements that we reached. 
uh, implemented effectively. So I think an envoy at this particular time, yes, but let's be very clear as to the role um, that an envoy can play and the difficulties in maneuvering around the positions that the parties adopt and the tendency to reach agreement on some of these issues but not move to have them implemented. So, yes, but let's work out the brief as clearly and as possible. And I would just add to that, it needs to be empowered through um, uh, the White House that's willing to change the status quo. Um, the State Department is so embedded with its relationship with Britain that it's often unwilling to really try and push a different point of view. Um, and so uh, an envoy is only really effective if they have the backing of uh, a, a job that's slightly different than the normal State Department interaction with Britain, and that, that isn't always the case. So I think it, it, it would need to be combined with a vision of what we're trying to get yeah. done and the willingness to put some political capital into it, which is not easy. Right, right. Well, I think we have time for some questions from the floor. Uh, there are people with microphones uh, on each side of the room, so if you'd raise your hand and make known that you have a question, and we request that you keep your question uh, short and direct to allow as many people as possible to uh, state their uh, query. Good evening, all. Thank you all for being here. My name is Tom Carty. And I note that one of the sponsors of this evening's event is the Patton John Hume Foundation. And I assume that that's mi the mission of the foundation is to sort of continue the model of peace that uh, John was very uh, involved in establishing. I wonder if you could, uh, Sean, particularly speak to the kinds of projects and initiatives that the foundation is proposing to attack, if you will, the, the, the problems that now exist in Northern Ireland and maybe peace problems generally. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I take it the question is directed towards myself and I'll try to answer as briefly as, as I can. The foundation was uh, launched November uh, two years ago and uh, since then we have been operating a program of, of various kinds of events and so on. The characteristics, a few of the characteristics of the, of the foundation are, first of all, we have a board which is cross-community in, in the sense that people are drawn from, on a 14, 15 member board, are drawn from uh, both communities in, in the sense that we understand the two communities and the main communities in Northern Ireland. We have Mike Nesbitt, who is former leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. We have, uh, a member of the former Progressive Unionist Party. Uh, we have people who are non-politically affiliated and so on. So we're trying to reflect uh, the values and the vision of, of John and Pat Hume. And we deliberately um, entitled the foundation the John and Pat Hume Foundation because we know those of us who, who work closely with John and knew Pat's involvement that she contributed a huge amount uh, to sustaining John's commitments and working quietly in the background uh, in order to ensure that John's message was heard loud and clear throughout the, throughout the community in Northern Ireland. Our programs have been directed at young people. Our very first uh, event was an event which, in which Martin Luther King III addressed and engaged with uh, pupils from uh, several schools across North, the senior pupils from several schools across Northern Ireland, um, and was encouraging them to participate in politics, working for their local communities, and so on. That was a fascinating uh, event. We have uh, launched recently a series of uh, engagements under the general title of building the common ground. Events since uh, the collapse of the 
uh, institutions in Northern Ireland or their suspension, um, have left us not working the common ground together to the extent that we need in order to develop reconciliation and ensure that the peace process is firmly embedded in, in, in Northern Ireland. And so we've had speakers, participants from different uh, political parties addressing, well, for the most part over the last two years, uh, addressing people via Zoom um, and encouraging the dialogue which we think is necessary across the community in Northern Ireland. Uh, we are working currently on a legacy project to be located in Derry, which will be a center for conflict resolution, the John and Pat Hume Center for Conflict Resolution, to give it a working title. And, and that will consist of a building, and the work, will, the work engaged in uh, the center will follow the pattern that um, our programs have over the last two years. Uh, for details on that, if you visit the, the humefoundation.org, you will see the regular series of events that we've, we've been having. And they are all based on the interests and the beliefs and the commitments and the principles that John articulated. Um, for example, we held last year a, a, a two-day conference on the future of Europe. John, of course, was an elected member of the European Parliament. He served there for 25 years. He was deeply committed to the principles and the values of uh, the European project. And we want to see that articulated and developed insofar as we can uh, within the work that the foundation undertakes. So it's a, there's a wide variety of events and initiatives under our umbrella. And we are looking to, through an event like this evening's, make sure that uh, more and more people are made aware of what the, what the Hume Foundation is all about. Yes, any other questions from the audience? Okay. Yes, over here. Hello, um, my question is hopefully direct, but I would, um, I guess I would direct it to, to all panelists. So one of the things that I find particularly striking um, you know, in listening to everyone chat today is the marriage of executive officials um, and some really productive grassroots organizing. Um, I'm curious, you know, looking at the global stage today and so many journeys towards peace, um, what your thoughts are on the involvement of youth and particularly the consequences and the opportunities that social media um, brings. Well, I mean, um, if I understand the question, um, I mean, social media, of course, is, um, it can be extremely toxic, as you know, and it's, uh, it's a hornet's nest of, of, um, of misinformation and, and uh, downright um, lies and, and calumny, but it also has the capacity to connect people across the globe. And I find a lot of people that I come across on social media are, are, are living productive lives and are using the, the social media universe uh, productively. Um, it seems to me at least that, that um, in Northern Ireland um, uh, and in many conflicts, uh, younger people um, need to take ownership of, of what's been achieved because um, it's very easy for people who are young in Northern Ireland today not to remember what it was like 25 years ago. As a young press spokesman for the Department of Foreign Affairs 25, 30 years ago, I had the, the terrible, agonizing task of almost on a nightly basis having to write a statement for the Minister for Foreign Affairs at the time condemning the latest killing in Northern Ireland. And that's something that people can easily forget. I remember it because I can still remember the dire necessity of having to sit down 
and find new ways of condemning the terrible things that were happening in Northern Ireland. So I think it's important for younger people to take ownership. And I know that there are many who believe that there is a new generation of people emerging in Northern Ireland. And that's probably one of the reasons why the centre ground has actually strengthened over the last few years that younger people, and I noticed, for example, the Alliance Party, uh, which got a lot of seats uh, in the Assembly in the last elections a couple of months ago, I noticed that they have a lot of young faces and voices. A lot of women have, have come into public life through the Alliance Party. And one of the great tragedies, if the Assembly is not allowed to, to take up its, 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 its task, and if the executive is not allowed to be formed, is that these people who have been elected will be disillusioned. And the people who supported them will also be disillusioned and will be, will, uh, will be turning the clock back. I would like to see those younger people who have come into politics in the last few months given the chance to actually see what they can do to change the, the way in which Northern Ireland is run politically. And that's why it would be a tragedy if, if this kind of hardline refusal to go into government to allow the Assembly to operate were to, to set us back and put us back into a kind of a, a, a situation of a, of a tribal divide again with, with the centre ground squeezed out, out of existence. Thank you, Dan. I think we have uh, time for one more Sorry, question. Nancy was there is one. Over here. How you doing? I have a question regarding your opinion of the electorate of Northern Ireland. Since the Good Friday Peace Agreement, both communities have voted for the two very parties that were against the agreement and where the vocal representations, you could say, of the paramilitary groups on the respective sides. So while the recent elections, there's been a bit of a split within the loyalist community, we haven't seen that on the nationalist community. And also the push for a border poll, which can be rather detrimental to the ongoing peace process in Northern Ireland. So what do you think of that? Do you want to handle that one, Sean? Yeah, I didn't quite clearly yeah, I hear, the, hear, the, hear the question. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean, I, okay. Uh, do you want me to ask you yeah, again? Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. Just in relation to the electorate of Northern Ireland, since the Good Friday Peace Agreement, the very parties that brought the peace agreement to the front and did all the hard lifting and the hard work are not the ones that have benefited in the polls since then. Sinn Féin and the DUP have the, are the parties of prominence within all the elections since then. There has been a bit of a split within the Loyalist vote in the last election, but not in the nationalist community. And Sinn Féin are pushing for a border poll, which most people, south anyway, and I've leveled thought in the north, see that as a detrimental issue at the moment. It's a bit too soon. So what's the panel's opinion in relation to what they see with the electorate and why they're voting the way they are. They're not acknowledging the efforts that were done by the parties that put their heads out of the trench first. Yeah. I'll try and, and tackle some, some of that. Because personally, I saw my vote. I stood in the constituency of North Antrim. And in the post-Good Friday Agreement election, the first election after that, I had 8,000 first preference votes. In the election that followed, my vote, although I was elected, had dropped to 4,000. And I could not work out, and I still can't really work out, why my vote went down so much. And Sinn Féin's vote in the same constituency went up, whereas in the first, in the, in the first post Good Friday Agreement election, they didn't get a candidate elected. Uh, maybe this is an oversimplistic uh, conclusion to draw from that situation. We didn't move after the Good Friday Agreement was signed. We didn't move, or the parties that were responsible for decommissioning, the paramilitary parties, if you like, 
didn't move to decommission very quickly. In fact, there was a gap from, nine, from 2002 until 2007 when eventually the decommissioning of paramilitary weapons took place. That gap enabled the parties, uh, maybe not enabled is the word, but the, during that, that period, uh, the parties within the unionist community that were most opposed to the agreement were able to say, look, look what's happened. Sinn Féin are in the executive or have a potential part of the executive, but they haven't moved their paramilitary organizations, the IRA, haven't moved to decommission. And as one party threatened on one side of the community, another party threatened on the other side. And so instead of moving quickly to decommission in 2001, 2002, uh, we were left with a situation that a commitment that had been made in the Good Friday Agreement to achieve decommissioning within two years was not being fulfilled. And in that context, more hardline parties were able to move center stage because that's where all the limelight was shining and the prospects for the power sharing executive diminished quite considerably until eventually in 2006 a degree of decommissioning did take place and on the back of that it was possible to restore the institutions but it left that period in which decommissioning wasn't happening left the advantage with uh, parties like Sinn Féin and the DUP. Um, th that's my simple explanation for, for why it happened in the way it did and why the Good Friday Agreement ran into a suspension in 2002. Could I just... Yeah, that's I think it's sorry. also just... Um, you know, confrontation and youth, they, they, they tend to have a momentum in politics that is not necessarily linked to governing. Governing is kind of boring. You're making decisions. And I, I, I think one of the most admirable and courageous decisions that John Hume made was to support Jerry Adams' stardom, really. I mean, I mean when the National Committee created this conference where John Hume um, wasn't going to be the star, it was going to be Jerry. This was the, the, the peace conference that triggered our decision on the visa to let Jerry Adams go to this peace conference run by two wonderful, now since gone, uh, Irish Americans, Bill Flynn and Tom Moran, who've never really gotten the full credit for what they did. It was extraordinary. Um, and John ended up going to that conference knowing he wouldn't be the star. And what you've seen is over time, Sinn Féin eclipsing the SDLP but that doesn't diminish for one second John's courage in saying, I see the way for peace, but I'm gonna let somebody else deliver it. And that's extraordinary, but it, it, politics is tough. You don't get credit for the hard, boring work. <laughs> um, as a lot of people in his worked in the Senate are, it's, it's really tough and frustrating at times, but um, leadership is about resisting that tough, quick win that just appeals to people's emotions taking a longer path. And you don't always win, to your point. It's the, sometimes it goes in the wrong direction, and that's, where, that's what you know, statesmanship is all about, is make, seeing the long, long vision, which um, John Hume really had in spades, and, and uh, to his great personal credit, went ahead and did it, knowing that it would undermine his political standing. In a polarized society, the poles tend to do well, and the middle tends to get squeezed. It often happens. I think the tragedy was that after 25 years, you, you should be expecting that the polarization would be reduced, and we have seen some evidence of that with the uh, good performance of the Alliance Party in the recent elections. Unfortunately, the Brexit issue has kind of come into the picture and has kind of created further divisions in Northern Ireland in a way that uh, that is not helpful that it has caused, that it, that it set back the process of, of maybe a, a normalization of political life and uh, a different kind of debate being allowed to uh, develop. And, and I mean, when I was critical of 
my earlier remarks of Brexit. I wasn't critical of the referendum, the decision of people that people made in Britain in 2016, but I was, I was more referring to the, to the, to the, 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 uh, the politicisation of that and the fact that, that it's been that that that, that um, uh, result, that referendum result, is perfectly reasonable for people to vote as they saw fit, but the way it's the way it's panned out has been problematic, I would say, for for Northern Ireland especially, because it's it has added to the the divisions that are there, and we now have a situation where um, the British government, which is um, supposed to exercise rigorous impartiality is actually taking the position of one of the parties in the assembly and is going against the majority of those who were elected recently who want to make the protocol work and is perhaps you know we now have a situation where we have the standoff and that's why i think the u.s um, influence may well be uh, important in the in the months and years ahead to try and resolve this set of set of standoffs that we need to, uh, to overcome. Which is, the yeah, answer to Aidan's oh. question is, do we still need the U.S.? The answer is absolutely. Yeah. I, I think to answer that question, though, I think another reason for polarization is that you have a follow-up agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, that in some ways polluted it. You need the mic. There's a the microphone. Agreement. And uh, that effectively turned the elections. Uh, the, you had a follow-up agreement to the Good Friday Agreement called the St. Andrews Agreement. The St. Andrews Agreement effectively determined that the first minister would be elected by the lar largest party rather than by uh, consensus of the assembly as a whole. And I think that really helped pollute the spirit of the agreement in that it turned the subsequent elections into somewhat of a sectarian headcount. Thank you, Aidan. I think we've reached the, the time limit for the panel. I'd like you to uh, give a round of applause to our three panelists. And uh, Nancy and, and uh, the ambassador and myself uh, are going to uh, exit the podium. And Sean, I think you go to the podium to, uh, for your concluding remarks. Just very briefly, on, on my own behalf, and indeed on behalf of the, of the board of the uh, John and Pat Hume Foundation, I want to, to thank you all for being with us uh, this evening uh, to mark what was a very, very historic and very, very important encounter between John Hume and Senator Edward Kennedy way back in 1972. I want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, the following members of the Institute here, Sue Hellman and Caroline Angle Burke. Thank you very much for all your assistance in helping uh, this uh, event to take place. I want to thank uh, the Ambassador, Dan Mulhall, and his colleagues uh, from the Irish Consulate here in Boston, uh, Leisha Moore, Shane McCaffrey and Anne Byrne. I want to thank uh, Joe Kennedy, representing the Kennedy family here this evening for being with us. I want to thank Aidan Hume, of course, for being with us, representing uh, the Hume family. And finally, I want to thank Catherine Shannon uh, for moderating uh, this evening's event. And I want to invite you all to join us uh, for some refreshment next door. Thank you all very much. Good evening and good night. <laughs>